All right, so we're going to begin. We're going to continue Pedic Mem 5 that we started last week, chapter 46. I thought we would be able to do 47. We're going to leave it for next week, Ms. Natasha. So 26 today? 46, Mem oh, 5. 46. <coughs> what I will do is I'm going to give you a brief introduction about certain ideas that we explained last time that will help us understand the rest of the chapter. It's not a very <laughs> difficult chapter, so I think we can go through it quite quickly. And, and I'll be able to just follow the text with you because everything flows and it will take us in this way less time. We covered last week the idea of how it definitely makes a difference when one sees how somebody else likes them. Even though they may have started not liking him or not knowing how much they should like someone, the fact that they are being displayed, friendship and love, is very meaningful. It makes a difference on people. And it makes a difference in two ways. Shlomo Mela tells us in Mishlei Kamayim Apanim Lapanim Ken Lev HaAdam LaAdam. You can see your own reflection of water. In the same way that one sees the reflection, his own reflection in the water, so does the heart reflect another's heart. How you feel towards someone, that is how they feel towards you. In other words, they are reflecting their feelings, their sentiments to you in the same way that you are reflecting those feelings. It's mutual, pretty much. In this way, one can know if somebody's really his friend or not a friend. It could be neutral, not an enemy, but one can have an idea of how much someone really cares about them, how much they respect him, you know, if they can get along with them, depending on how they feel towards them. Feelings are also important for a second reason, because even though the connection may not be there, we can generate that connection. When one does something, when one helps another individual, that individual naturally owes him something that's called being grateful to the individual who has helped you. So certain feelings that are positive can generate positive feelings in another individual, and the more so if those feelings are accompanied with action, because actions speak louder than words, as the saying goes. So one can also improve a relationship by bringing those feelings out, the positive feelings, and in this way, that other individual will also reciprocate with more positive feelings, even though at one time they may not have been getting along. If those feelings are accompanied with real actions, then act those actions obviously will make even a greater difference. We explained how the more so if that love and friendship is coming from a king and it's going towards an individual who's homeless, who has nothing going for him, has no friends, the king loves me, the king relates to me, he wants to come to see me, he wants to help me. Obviously, it is expected that that individual who feels left out, perhaps unloved, unwanted, will feel tremendous love for the king, for the individual who is so kind. What is missing then? What is missing from an individual to be able to see all of this, if it's so obvious, Hidbonenut. Well, especially when we talk about Hashem, what is lacking, what people do not do enough, or at all, is they don't reflect. They don't understand that life is a gift. Hashem loves us. The whole creation is an act of chesed, of love, of kindness from Hashem. People don't see it that way because they're mixed up a little bit, can't blame them completely, because they see a lot of evil in the world. How come there's evil? Where's all that loving kindness if there was something like a holocaust? So people are confused. But confusion only stems from ignorance. If you don't learn, if you don't look at the blueprint, the Torah, then obviously you are at a disadvantage. You have no clue as to what is going on. What is Hashem's plan? What is He designing for the future? Is there such a design? Is there such a plan? There is. The prophets talk about that. So it takes awareness. It takes learning. 
Because when we're dealing with the Jewish people, it is extra sensitive. We have a very, very strong relationship with Hashem. We have a commitment that we made in our seven Ishma, we will follow the Torah Mitzvot. So we have great responsibilities. A lack of an awareness can make a big difference whether we succeed in our mission or not. For a non-Jew, it's important too. But he has seven Noach laws, Sheva Mitzvot Ben Noach. He has to behave himself. He has to recognize the deity. He has to recognize that there's a God. He must realize that he's accountable for his actions. He must maintain peace and order. And that is the necessity of a system of laws and judges in every country. Without that, it, there's tyranny, there's chaos. As it is, even with laws, even with judges, even with police, we have crime, we have corruption. The reason why I say corruption is because when we talk about crime, we think about criminals and gangsters. But even politicians can be corrupt. They're, they're gangsters too, in a different way. They're <laughs> gangsters that wear a tie. <laughs> yeah? They commit different kinds of crimes. And then there's the people that point out, well, I know a, a, a rabbi that was sent to jail. Yes. What do you think? Rabbis are angels? Just because they have a long beard? A goat also has a beard. <laughs> so what? Does the beard protect him? He has an evil inclination. It could be for women, it could be for money, it could be an anger management problem, it could be laziness. There are many, many things that people have that we call weaknesses, weaknesses of character. We all need to refine our character. But don't look at the bad guys, look at the good guys. There's a lot of angels in this world, Jews and non-Jews. Focus on the good people, because you're going to be very disappointed if you look at all the bad. There is bad too. But the fact that you have people who are angels prepared for self-sacrifice proves the point. They don't have to do that. What does it prove? It proves that there's something spiritual about the human being too, not just that he's an animal. He's definitely an animal, something's worse than an animal. But he could be an angel, or close to an angel. And to better understand this topic, uh, I spoke about it. There's a lecture about crossing the bridge from the physical to the, to the spiritual world or the fifth dimension called spirituality. Important lectures that, that shed some light about this area that is not very known or very well understood by people. Spirituality, what does it mean that we have a soul? What is the soul, the composition of the soul, all about? One can see Hashem's kindness in many, many ways. We are reminded here of how Hashem, the king, the king of all kings, took us out of Egypt. What he did for us throughout our history protected us. He took us out from the filth, exactly like the mashal that he gave with the king taking a, a homeless person from the ashpot, from the dirt, from the garbage, from the dumps, and bringing him to the palace. When Hashem gave us the Torah, when he chose us, not that we're better. Obviously, he felt that we had certain ingredients that are necessary in order to preserve the Torah. She doesn't want to give the Torah just for a couple of generations and then it disappears, like many cultures and civilizations. They disappeared. They didn't last. She wants this to last. This particular mission needs to last because this is the only chance for the world to rectify itself. You have been chosen for this job. Everybody has a different job. This is your job, a spiritual job. In speaking about how Hashem has taken the Jewish people out from Egypt, from the dumps, and elevated them to a high status, it reminds me of several individuals, quite a few, who went through the Holocaust. You know what it means? Depending on which country you were, it could mean up to six years of hell, okay, no, especially for Polish Jews. For Hungarians and for Romanians, it was less. Depending where you were in Europe, it was worse than hell. But they made it. Hashem protected them. Somehow they survived miraculously. Some of them came to this country. And I know, and I knew many of them. So imagine where they were before, during the war. And when they came to this country, they were still selling milk. I don't know if you remember those days. I'm not sure in Iran, but in America, 
and in other countries too, they used to sell milk at the doorstep. It was a milkman. And uh, some of them took any job. I know one of them who used to wash the vitrines, the, the windows of the storefronts. Class. That was his job. Low paying jobs, but they did anything they can to support their families. These people eventually became, not rich, millionaires. And you may have known some of them. I'm not going to mention names. Most of them are no longer with us. Obviously, Holocaust survivors passed away. But they made it very, very successful in this country. You can clearly see a blessing. But why do I point to them as an example? Because Gashpot Yarim Evyon, as the verse says, sometimes Hashem takes somebody from the dumps. A poor man, Gashpot Yarim, he elevates him. He makes them rich overnight. Hopefully that individual will know how to use his money properly. And there were many, quite a few, who went through the Holocaust and somehow, maybe because of the Holocaust, they were blessed. All of these individuals, I hope, I would hope that they thanked Hashem. Some perhaps made a special meal on the day they were liberated to remember what they experienced, that they went from Auschwitz to freedom. But this is what the Jewish people are supposed to do as well. We, it's Yat Mitzrayim, on Pesach, that's what Pesach, the holiday, Passover, is all about, is to not just celebrate with eating matzah. It's not just about matzah, it's not about not eating chametz, it's remembering the miracles, which is what the Haggadah of Pesach is all about, giving thanks to Hashem, sharing the story of America with our children, transmitting the tradition to the next generation. That is why the rabbis instituted many, many blessings, the majority of which are not in the Torah, they're rabbinical. Blessings. Bless before you put something into your mouth, make a blessing. After you finish eating, make a blessing. What are all the blessings for? To give thanks to Hashem. To remember His kindness. But there's something else with the blessing. The blessing is a small prayer. What's prayer all about? It's about connection to Hashem. It's not just requests. Hashem, I need this, I need that, I need that. No. Hashem wants a connection with us. As the rabbis tell us, sometimes He holds something back because He wants us to ask Him. If we wouldn't ask Him, we would lose that connection with Him. We would forget about Him, God forbid. So Berachot, Tefilot, is a way of forming a connection with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, with Hashem. But it's not just a connection. What else does a Berachah contain? A karatatov, gratefulness. When we make a blessing, we're not just connecting to Hashem. Of course, we realize that He gives us the food. Yes, I, but be thankful. Be grateful for it. Because in the same way that, that Hashem provides for you here with food, He's the one that provides you children. He gives you life. Remember that. So gratefulness, Sakrata Tov, is a very important midah. It's an important midah, an important characteristic, if you want to stay connected with Hashem. We, unfortunately, sometimes in our life go through difficult times, challenges. And we need to remember that there were good times too. There was chesed. People who came out of the Holocaust and asked, where was God? What do you mean, where was God? Look, He saved you. That's where He was. He was busy with you. What do you mean, where was God? Yes, I, I understand. He's talking about the six million who perished. But can't you see Him with you? He saved your life. Isn't it true that you saw miracles, that you witnessed, that you could write several books on the many miracles you had experienced? Yes, yes, I could. I could. Okay. You see? What do you think that is? Just by chance? Random? Why you survived, not the others? Now we don't know. But we have to be thankful. The blessing provides us an opportunity to recognize the chesed of Hashem and to express our thanks to Him. Along with these things, of course, we form a connection with Him. What we will see in the rest of the Perek is a little bit more of an elaboration about this connection, which happens through mitzvot and Torah.
a Jew observes the mitzvot when he learns Torah, he connects to Hashem. How does he connect to Hashem? What exactly happens to him? Does he feel a connection? People think that the mitzvot is our duty. Not only is it our duty, you want to be rewarded in the world to come, you do the mitzvot, you learn Torah. You will be rewarded. It's true. We will be rewarded. Hashem wants us to have a share to the world to come, which is a life of eternity. He wants us to work for it, not to give it for free. Okay. So we do the mitzvot, we learn the Torah. But it's much more than that. We're talking about the physical world. The physical world is very, very physical in nature. As a result of that, the human being, even though he has a spiritual neshama, a good, refined soul, the body is physical. And because of the physicality of the world, of the physical body, one does not clearly see Hashem. One does not necessarily sense with ease that which is spiritual. There's a lot of physicality that is blocking the way. The mitzvot, therefore, help refine that physical body. That's what the mitzvot do. They refine the physical, that which is material. And once an individual is refined, all of a sudden he's able to see more than 2020. His vision is so clear, he sees spirituality and he senses it. And he's happier. He feels the connection with Hashem. He not only knows it, he actually feels it. So, that is the meaning of Kedoshim Tiyu, which he will explain. Be holy. Be holy? What is holiness? I'm holy, Hashem says. You want to be connected to me? You need to avoid certain things. You need to do certain things. Follow this recipe. Kedoshim to you, and you will be holy. You will be close to me. You want to connect to me? Through the Torah and through the mitzvot. Because the Kedushah, holiness, is not just something that is apart, as we will soon see, from everything else. It is elevated. Kedushah means two things. Havdalah and Itromemut. Separation from everything else that is forbidden for us, that which is unclean and pure, and Itromemut, to be elevated, to be closer to Hashem. So all the misfold, what they have in common is to elevate us, to refine our character. As a result of that, we gain a greater awareness of Hashem. Our connection becomes stronger, mm -hmm. And as a result of that stronger connection, in greater awareness, we're actually able to feel, have greater sensitivity toward that which is spiritual. A Jew that is sensitive to spirituality is excited to do the mitzvot a lot more than someone who's not aware, who's not as refined. He thinks of it as a burden. And this is somewhat the difference between the average Jew and the avot. As you recall, we mentioned various times in the Tanya, that the Avot are the Merkava, they are the chariot. They pretty much were in automatic mode. To them it was clear what Hashem wants and expects of them. And they would do so willingly without too much hesitation. Their awareness had greater clarity. They sensed it. They had no doubts about it. Now, was their level of the Shema, of course, the higher level of the Shema, was closer to Hashem. They're called the Merkava, the chariot, chariot that runs by itself, that does the will of Hashem without too much hesitation. We have a struggle. We need to think about it. Are we in the mood or not in the mood? Do we understand it or not? It's a lot harder, it takes more effort, but that's okay. Rabbis promise us that according to the effort will be the reward. If you, you were not brought up with it, and you taught this to yourself, and on your own you reached great heights, which is possible, then you will be rewarded accordingly. Everything is according to the effort invested. Is it possible? We said yes. Even the lowest of the lowest can connect to Hashem in a very, very grand way. Especially when he becomes aware of how much Hashem is so kind to him. 
He took him out from the dumps. He saved his life. The more so that he will want to hopefully have an interest in connecting to Hashem. One of the Chidushim, one of the things that he told us in the last chapter that was very, very unique was that even the lowest of the lowest, the simple person, can connect to Hashem. All that is required is awareness. What we therefore can infer from all of this is that a Jew without Torah and Mitzvot, not only is he disconnected, he's missing out on his true potential. Because what's the true potential? We just finished saying to refine his character to become a better person. And even if he's a good person by nature, there are people that their nature is really, really good and soft. Many, many non-Jews, righteous people. They don't have Torah and Mitzvot. Still, there's a big difference. Because to be able to reach the highest form of love for Hashem, a powerful connection that is not like it, you need the Torah and Mitzvot. That it should be bo'er ka'esh, it should be ardent, powerful, prepared for self-sacrifice. You need pure faith for that. Otherwise, imagine a good person. He's good. But you offer him a bribe for whatever reason. You know, he's in the position that can make a certain decision that will help you. And you offer him $250,000. Let's just say, you know, that's what it takes to bribe. Will he take it? Yes. Many, many human beings who are good, righteous, can be bribed. The Torah says so. The wise and the righteous can be corrupted. Because money is powerful. Very, very, very powerful. What's needed to avoid that bribe, to overcome it? Tremendous bitachon, trust in Hashem. That money will not make a difference in my life. On the contrary, it's not money that is blessed. If anything, it may ruin me, Chazm Shalom. And it's forbidden too. So, some people will think about it. Some people will not think about it. Some people, will, of course, will avoid it altogether, depending on their level of emuna and bitachon in Hashem. In order for you to be impressed how much there's a lack of awareness of divinity and spirituality in the world, is look at all the evil in the world. There's a lot of evil. Mm -hmm. People who kill. People who do anything for money, for power. There's a lot of evil that always has been. I just say this because in order for us to be impressed on where morality or spirituality can make a difference is in human behavior. It, it can make a difference. Some people, yes, are born with a more refined nature, which, by the way, is not a guarantee it will always be this way. It's definitely helpful. There's a lot of good people who have no Torah and no direction. But there's also a lot of evil. Focus for a minute on the evil. Where is all this evil coming from? From a lack of awareness that there is a God to whom we are accountable. And for not refining our character. The more physical and materialistic a person is, the further he is away from the light of Hashem, from that which is spiritual. So even the one who's very, very low, makes no difference. If he embraces Torah and Mitzvot, he can definitely gain a lot. And what about those that don't have Torah and those who are not Jewish? They may still have a spark in them of kindness, divinity that pulls them to do the right thing, to be helpful, to be kind and charitable to people. Obviously, that spark in them is not so dim. They're lucky. For whatever reason, there are various explanations to why certain individuals are pulled, drawn, to be charitable and kind-hearted with others, but it definitely shows the spark in them, the divine spark in action. It's coming from that. It's not coming from anything else. It's not because their heart is different. Open up their chest and look in their heart. It's the same kind of heart. I mean, the heart is the same. Where's the difference? Education? Not necessarily. You have people who really love to help, even though their own parents may not have been like that. It's a divine spark in them. But, just to finish up with the introduction, in order to connect 
on a permanent basis to that which is divine, to Hashem, what's needed is itchayvut, commitment. Without the word commitment, a person can be good one day, and not necessarily as good the following day. And that is what he will talk a little bit about, but he will use the word kiddushin instead. What's kiddushin? When a man tells his wife, areat mekudeshetli, you are sanctified to me. Only you, no one else. And what that means, is not just marriage underneath the chuppah, the canopy. It means a life of commitment, of devotion to each other. That's what's supposed to be. People don't understand what it means. They just think I'm placing a ring on her finger. And, he sh and she says, I do, I accept, or whatever, depending on your custom. No. You want kesher shel kayama? You want a permanent connection with your spouse? It's called kiddushin. It's called mechuyavut. It's called commitment. It's not just a proposal. It's a promise that hopefully we will have the strength and the interest to keep for as many years as possible. People lose interest because the commitment was not as strong. So connection is important, but in order for the connection to last, one is going to need commitment. So this is all pretty much an introduction to where we left off and how Hashem has taken out the Jewish people from Egypt, using the mashal of the king, taking this homeless person out of the dirt. And Hashem has left the upper worlds, has left the lower worlds, and has chosen us. And that's how he begins with the rest of the Perich. So I will read part of it from the inside. Vinoda, he says, as it is known from the Zohar and from the writings of the Ari, How many echalot, chambers, how many worlds, spiritual worlds Hashem has? And there is numerous, numerous, you can't count how many angels there are in every one of the worlds. As it says in the Gemara, Is there really a number to his regiments, to his army of angels? And it says, Elef alfin yesham shune. Elef alfin, a thousand, times a thousand, how much is that? A million. Serve him. And tens and tens of thousands serve him. Wait a minute. You just said that there's no number. It's unlimited. And now you're giving a number? You're giving a million, tens of thousands. Which one is it? Is there a number or it, there isn't? And the Gemara explains, Mishane, Elef alfin, mispar gdud echad. Yes, if you count one regiment, that's the number of angels in one regiment. But how many regiments? That there's no number. Try to figure out today how many galaxies there are. Billions, billions. They change the number every so often. They can't tell. So many galaxies. What are they all about? So I have a lecture about that. Why did Hashem make the stars and the galaxies? What, what purpose do they serve? But we already begin to see what he's talking about here. The numerous, numerous stars, the numerous, numerous angels, which they all, by the way, serve a purpose. Unlimited amount. And all these, kulam kame kilo mamash chashive. They're nothing before him. Betelim be mamash all of these are annulled in him in the same way that an utterance of speech, which we explained several times, is annulled in the power of speech while it's still in the machshava or in the lev, when it's still in our thought and the heart. It's annulled. You don't see it. Once it comes out from the mouth, you hear it. You're aware of it. So that's the idea here. Just like our dibur is annulled in its origin, where it comes from, it is as though it doesn't exist. In the same way, all of these things that Hashem said that they should be, it is all part of Him. It is all annulled. So it's just like the utterance, He says, in its origin, whether it's in the thought or that it's in the desire of Him that I live, as was explained at length 
the previous chapters. The Kulam Shualim, he continues on to say, and everybody asks, where is he? Ayyemekom Kevodo, where is his place of glory? Veonim male kolaretz kevodo hem Yisrael amu. And the old angels answer, he fills the entire world. His glory fills the entire world. And who is that glory? Am Yisrael, the Jewish people. What does that mean? Ki niach ha-kadosh baruchu. Hashem has left the talionim et ha-tachtonim velo bachar vekulam kim b'Yisrael amu. He left the upper world, he left the lower worlds. Not that he abandoned them, but he focused only on the Jewish people. Just to get an idea of what does it mean to focus. Look around the Milky Way as much as possible, as much as we can, as much as we know, as far as we know. There is no life anywhere except for on Earth. A small planet compared to the rest of them. Even though Mercury is smaller, right? Several planets are smaller than the Earth. Right? The majority of them, especially the stars, are, are much bigger. So Hashem chose this small little place, and only there you'll find an exact balance of the <coughs> gases necessary for life to be sustained. Water, temperature, only here. Look how the whole focus of the entire Milky Way, the entire universe as far as we know, is on this one earth. This is where all the action is. Talk about the physical world right now, not the spiritual world. This is where it is. And in this physical world, there's one little country. <laughs> you barely see it on the map. You barely see it on the globe. It's called Eretz Israel. Very, very small. Same thing with the Jewish people. We're not billions of people. Not yet. When Mashiach comes, well, that's a different story. All the tribes are going to come back, and then, of course, there will be Tchiat Amitim, the dead will rise. That's a really different calculation. But right now, we're a small minority. The focus is there. For good or for bad. Obviously, because we play an important role. So he let, that's what he means. He left everything to focus on us. What did he do for us? He took us out from the filth of Egypt, from the most promiscuous or immoral place on earth. And he didn't do it as it says, Hashem himself went down. As the verse says, the Pasuk says, I went down to take you out. I went down personally. I did not use angels for this. Look how much love and attention Hashem gave us to take us out to save us what for? to bring us close to him a very very long a very very strong and intense connection a connection of the soul it's a spiritual connection which happens through the Torah Mitzvot in the form of a kiss a spiritual kiss. Pe le pe le daber. In order to to speak. To speak what? To say what? Var Hashem, the words of Hashem. Zu alacha. That's the alacha that we learn. That we fulfill. Vidapkut rucha berucha, in the connection of the spirits. He has sagata Torah vidiyat etzono v'chokmato. It is acquiring the knowledge of the Torah, knowing His will, because His will and His chokmah are all one. The will of Hashem, as expressed through the mitzvot, the chokmah, which is the deeper understanding of why we do things. So when we observe a mitzvah, when we learn about it. That's called Ratzon Hashem because we are complying with His Ratzon, His will. When we dig deeper into it, we're connecting with His Chokhmah. And His Ratzon and His Chokhmah are really all one. Because these mitzvot need to be done. Began Bebchinat Chibuk, and then you have the aspect of embrace. We talked about the kiss, the connection, the spiritual connection of Rucha Berucha, two spirits. But what is the chibuk all about? There is a description of Hashem's embrace of us. 
the embrace is the kiyuma mitzvot ma'asiyot. It's the active fulfillment of the mitzvot. Beramach evanim beram with the 248 organs, because Ramach Pikudin and Ramach Yavamim de Malka. As we've explained before, the 248 commandments correspond or correlate to the 248 organs of the king. Kabbalistically, they are representing the will of Hashem. And when a Jew observes a certain mitzvah, that organ has an effect. That mitzvah has an effect on this world. Again, it's not just for us. The mitzvot are for the world as well. Certain mitzvot need to be fulfilled in order for a certain effect to take place in this world. And that's what they correlate or correspond to the 248 organs of the king. Correlate meaning that this is his will. This is what he wants us to accomplish. 248 types of functions need to happen. The Derech Klan says, and generally, Nechlakin, they are divided into three parts. The Shalosh Pchinot, three aspects, three parts, Yamin, Usmol, Ve'emtza. You have the right, the left, and the middle. Shein Chesedin, Ve'rachamim. You have Chesed on the right, kindness, you have Din, justice on the left, and you have Rachamim, which is in the middle pity or compassion. And they are tre drawing the gufa, they correspond to the two arms and the body, right? Two arms, right and left, and the body. What's this all about? Well, we're talking about an embrace. When a Jew observes the mitzvot, learns the Torah, he's embracing it and he's being embraced by Hashem through the Torah mitzvot. And that is the meaning, he says, that when we say a blessing and we say Hashem sanctified us through his mitzvot. What does it mean, sanctified? This is where he explains it according to the explanation I gave earlier. We're not necessarily talking about holiness here, Shekidishanu, that he made us holy. Here, Kedishanu means that he made with us like a Kedushim, a marriage contract. He took us for himself. Shekidishanu, through the mitzvot, he took us for himself. Just like a man sanctifies a woman, marries a woman for her to be his wife, be Yehud Gamur, unified in a unified way, that she belongs to him and he belongs to her. As the Pasuk says elsewhere, and he should connect to his wife and they should be one flesh. The whole idea of the Kiddushin in marriage and in mitzvot as well, is to combine the two to form a very strong connection in a way that involves commitment and devotion on a regular basis. Pretty much like this example, but more so, even more so. Much more so is the connection we just spoke about a physical connection, how strong it can be and it should be, the connection of a husband and wife. It can be very, very strong. And by the way, that example is used because that is the strongest connection. Children is a different kind of connection. We love them immensely because they're a part of us. That is partially instinct. Here we have a strong connection through a commitment where a husband says to his future wife, you are my wife. And she, of course, goes along with it. You are my husband. Connection of the highest form through commitment. But he says a lot more so when we talk about a spiritual connection. This is physical. Spiritual is a lot stronger than physical. That's the Yehud Nefesh Elokit. It's the connection that we form with the soul. Or that the soul's connection forms with Hashem. The soul's connection with Hashem, a spiritual connection, is a lot stronger. And how does it form that connection? How mitzvot, when it is involved in learning the Torah and observing the mitzvot. The nefesh achiyunit ulevushehen anal l'horen when it connects the divine soul as well as the animal soul 
when they are able to connect with the or and so with the light of Hashem. So they have that ability. This can be even a stronger connection than the physical connection. And this happens through Torah Mitzvot. Okay. So far, what did we understand? That what we've learned about descriptions of Kiddushin, embrace, kisses, and all that in the physical world, these are physical terms, they apply somewhat in the spiritual world as well. Even though we can identify with someone in this physical world, we like him, we hug him, we care about them, we feel that. Spiritually, it's something much more difficult to express and to explain. How do you love someone spiritually? He doesn't say it so much here, because now he's talking more about the connection with Hashem. But I'm going to share with you a word that you may never have heard of in English. That gives us a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about here. Have you heard of the word altruism? They have an altruistic relationship. He is altruistic. If you have a chance, look it up. Altruism is to do something for someone to care about them spiritually. I call it spiritually, but what it really means is that there's no physical connection there necessarily. You're not loving them because of the physical body, because of how you feel towards them physically. You're being altruistic, which means pure with no interest whatsoever. That's what altruism means. No interest no gain for you, but purely Leshem Shamayim, as we would say in our terminology, for the sake of heaven. This is just for the sake of caring for another individual, for the sake of caring for them. You understand what I'm saying? It's pure. It's not fake, and it's not physical. It could be physical too, but not necessarily. So you can have someone care for another individual, because after all, that's what love really means. Love means to care for someone. That's what really behind the word love. A lot of people have passion for someone, but they don't really love them, care about them. Let's see them do something for them. <laughs> right? Let them wait, it will never happen. They won't do it necessarily for them. So he's telling us a spiritual connection is a lot stronger than a physical connection. That is why when you look at Shira Shiri, the Song of Songs, you come across, wow, what beautiful poetry. Look at the words Shlomo Melech is using to describe a connection of sorts with a kiss, with an embrace, with a connection and a stronger desire and a more intense desire. If you look at the words that he uses here, you have different levels or different modes of expression of a connection that one can make. He's connected, or he is very much desirous of that individual, or he cares intensely about them, or he embraces them and kisses them, right? Various modes of expressing a connection, a physical connection, and this is the same in the spiritual realm, through the Torah and Mitzvot, through one's deeds. You have a lot of righteous people who are very, very much connected with Hashem on a very, very strong level. And you saw that desire, that intense desire, that interest in connecting, in embracing, in doing, as though this would be a form of a kiss because they were, imagine, very, very much engrossed in their studies, learning Torah all day, all day long and all night. And this is therefore the meaning. Now he talks about another form of Kedusha. We spoke about Kedusha meaning commitment, like Kedushim, like marriage contract. He says, but since we're talking about connection, he says here, the word Kedushana also means holiness. That he has sanctified us with his mitzvot, which means what? Sheheelanu. That he also elevated us. To the one of to the greatest heights, the height of holiness in the upper worlds. Shehik dushatosh la kadosh which is the holiness of Hashem Himself, b'chodov b'atzmo. 
We talk about elevating our deeds, elevating us through the deeds to where he is at, to his palace. And holiness really means, as I pointed out early, separation, being apart. And I've talked about this in various lectures, why we cannot marry somebody who's not Jewish, unless they convert, of course, sincerely. We have a mission to accomplish, and we cannot afford to do something that will weaken that mission. And if we marry somebody that has a whole different philosophy about life, a different world view, that will interfere. Nothing against the person himself. But we want to succeed. As it is, men and women are different. They fight from time to time. They have disagreements. What can we do? You want the individual, the Jew, to marry someone who will be against him, opposed to him? It can't work like that. Same thing with non-kosher food. What's wrong with horse meat? Anybody know? What? Horse meat. The French like horse meat. La viande de cheval. Yeah. What's wrong? They say it's tasty too. <laughs> it could be. It has nothing to do with health, nothing to do with taste. A horse belongs in the category of chayot me'ot, animals that are unclean for a Jew to eat. If you're not Jewish, you can eat it. Go ahead. As long as you cook it well. <laughs> That's all. You have a good recipe, go ahead, enjoy. Nothing wrong. But for the Jew, we have a specific mission to accomplish, very, very specific, and it's spiritual in nature. We cannot allow things that are unclean, impure, to interfere with that which is holy. Holiness cannot stand on holiness. They clash. So therefore, Vavdiletchem, I separate you. Oh, you Jews are always living apart, sheltering yourself. Yeah, we need to. We have no choice. We want to be around forever. We don't want to assimilate and just become like everybody else. We have a unique mission, which we believe in. We're prepared to give our lives for it. We're committed to it. We have no choice. We can't say no anymore. We committed it for ourselves and committed it for our children. So the Kiddushah that we say when we observe the Mitzvot, Hashem Kiddushah, we, that means Havdalah. Hashem is apart from all the worlds. And he is described as surrounding, enveloping the entire universe, because it is not really physically possible, that's the way he made it, that he should actually be absorbed into every physical being. What does that mean? Hashem can do anything. But he designed the world in such a way that that which is more more gas, coarse, more physical nature, is more distant from him. That's where there is a concealment of Hashem, which is what he's talking about here. That divinity does not dress itself up, cannot, because Hashem designed it that way, dress itself up and absorb itself in that which is physical, like a physical body. Unless you do something to connect with him, to come close to him, it's not automatic. So he is described, therefore, in this context, as Sovev Kol Almin. He envelops or surrounds everything. And the Jew can tap that level. The Jew can reach out through the Torah mitzvot to that higher level. In the physical body, he won't sense it so much. It won't be so natural for him to, to figure this out unless it is triggered through something. Obviously, Abraham Avinu did not just think of it on his own. He was one against everyone. He obviously had a special soul. Inquisitive, sensitive, pure, not yet contaminated by the culture of his family and surroundings. So Hashem, of course, chose him. Somebody has to be chosen to deliver the message to humanity, not just to the Jews, Abraham I'm talking about. So therefore he begins to ask questions. Who made all this? Who's the boss? Where is he? What does he want of us? Why did he give us life? Most people do not ask these questions. But he says why? Because it's not enveloped inside of them. It's above them. You have to reach out. 
כי על ידי ייחוד הנפש והתקללותה באור אין סוף ברוך הוא, הרי היא במעלת ומדרגת קדושת אין סוף ברוך הוא ממש. If you include yourself and unify yourself, your soul, that is, with the light of the end of, then you will be able to attain a ma'ala or madrega of kedushat and so on. You will be able to attain that level of holiness, of being close to the light, to the or and so on. Me'achar she mityachedet u mitkalelet bo itbarach v'yu l'achadi mamash, because Hashem will connect with you. And you become one with Him. So, by elevating oneself through the mitzvot, which means being mavdil yourself, separating yourself from that which the Torah says, separate yourself from them, you will become holier, you will become elevated, and you will be able to connect to that level of Kedusha, where Hashem is. And that is the meaning, V'yitem li Kedushim ki Kadosh ani Hashem, this is the meaning of these Pesukim. Be holy unto me, because I'm holy. In other words, if you want to be close to me, you have to be holy. You have to follow these mitzvot. And it is because of this holiness that I want you to achieve, that I I separate you from everybody else, from the rest of the nations. So you should be unto me. It further says, and you should do all these mitzvot. And in this way, you will be holy. Not only am I telling you be holy, I'm letting you know that you will be if you do, and you follow these mitzvot. And you will be holy unto Elokechem. Ani Hashem Elokechem. I am your God. Why does it tell us, Ani Hashem Elokechem, I'm yours? Ani Hashem Elokechem. Like a husband telling his wife, I'm your husband, you are my wife. You see the, the closeness here? Hashem is letting us know, this way you become mine, this way I become yours, this way we become one. It's all about connecting with Hashem. Once a connection is formed, obviously the awareness is there with a lot greater clarity than without a connection. Through the observance of Yitzvot, I will be your God, just like I'm called the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak. And why are they called like that? In other words, why does Hashem say, I'm their God? He's everyone's God. They are called like that. They have a certain special, unique relationship with Hashem. That Hashem says, I am their God. Because, as we said, they were the chariot. They were like a chariot, which means that they were completely annulled in His light at all times. Because we can also be connected to Hashem and be annulled. Yes, but they were annulled at all times. Even without necessarily observing a certain mitzvah. Because when one learns to write and observes a mitzvah, at that point he connects. You follow me? Whereas the Merkava is always connected at all times. We can connect through learning to write and observing them, so we can elevate ourselves. We need to do these actions. They were Merkava, which means they were connected at all times. That is what happens for every Jew. High level connection, when he learns Torah, observes the mitzvot. And the rabbis tell us in the Gemara something very interesting. When you see another Jew, even though he's not so learned, but he's in the midst of observing a mitzvah, stand up for him. Even if he's ignorant and not knowledgeable, it's because of the Hashem residing in him at that moment that he's involved in observing the mitzvah. This guy who's ignorant, who's just observing the mitzvah because he was told to, he may not be feeling that feeling of connection, even though it's there, he's observing a mitzvah, so the connection is there. Why doesn't he feel it? There's a curtain, a physical curtain, a physical barrier that is blocking his awareness, he doesn't feel it. Why? But why does he have more of a block than somebody else? Shalom is the kech. Because he is not refined. Machshich inea nefesh. If you're not refined through the continuous hard work of learning Torah mitzvot, just occasionally a mitzvah, if the body is not refined, 
then the soul's eyes are darkened. They're black. From being able to see spiritual visions with greater clarity. Like who? Like the great tzaddikim who were able to see, even while they were alive in a physical body, not asleep. They saw things, they knew things. Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration. High level, ketusha, connection, refinement, which brings awareness, a much greater awareness. There were a lot of people who saw the world, saw the, the, the higher level of the world, the world to come while they were still physically alive in this world. And this is what Asaf in Tehillim says, Beruch HaKodesh, that Kol Knesset Yisrael, Shebagola, telling, or talking about the Jewish people being in exile, And I'm ignorant, and I do not know you. I'm like a beast, an animal, with you. But I'm still with you, even though I may appear like an animal. What does that mean? Even though I, I'm nothing while I'm with you. This is a description of the Jewish people while they are in exile. So even though I'm like an animal when I'm with you, which means what? And I don't have this special feeling that I should have. I am like an animal that has no sense, no feelings, that does not have all this fear and later this ardent love that it should have, that it could have potentially. A love of delighting in Hashem, or a love that is burned in an ardent kimidat tzadikim, like the tzadikim sheni zdakeh chomram, whose physicality has been refined. So that's what it means. Even though I'm like an animal, I'm still close to you. When we talk about that, what, we, why, what is that? That is a certain feeling, a certain sensitivity that the soul has, which com is comprised of chesed and gevurah. That, as we've explained before, is also connection. It's not just knowledge. It entails a certain sensitivity. It's because of the sensitivity that that has that it is able to develop the Yiraina Hava properly. I thought they can even though I didn't have it as I as others do, and it I'm always with you. Don't think physicality prevents the light. that fills the entire universe from entering that which is physical. Physicality does not prevent the connection of the nefesh in the light. Like it says in the Pasuk, no darkness can, can darken you. So it does not prevent it. That is how we can understand the severity of someone who commits a sin in doing something that is forbidden on Shabbat or eating chametz on Pesach that is equal to every Jew, those who are knowledgeable or not. They are all guilty of the same offense if they transgress it. Because on certain days, that light is there and present on him. The physical barrier it does not prevent from the light from entering. It may not be expressed, it, it may not be uh, felt, it may not be felt so much. But it's still there, and because everybody has that light, even if he's ignorant, he's guilty. Because if he wouldn't have that, he could say, well, I didn't have any light on me. No, no. Every Jew, regardless, has that light entering him on Shabbat, on Pesach. And therefore, he will be judged with karet or skila, depending on the capital punishment, for desecrating this holiness. Even just a little bit of chametz, or moving something which is forbidden to move on Shabbat, called mukze, pogem, it causes damage to that which is holy on his nefesh. Just like it does to the nefesh of the tzaddik. They're both equally to blame, if they commit a wrong. 
Ki Torah achat lekulano. We all have the same Torah. Now, even though he says over here that everybody is to blame equally because we have the same Torah, the light, even though it does not penetrate all the way, because not everybody feels it, because um, if it would penetrate all the way, we would feel it, not everybody can experience it, perhaps. However, it's there, it's present, especially in certain days, or during the observance of a mitzvah, it's there. So if somebody were to go ahead and commit an offense, He's guilty, whether he's knowledgeable or not. Even though he does not feel the same way that Sadiq does, but the light is there, in potential it's there, it covers him, it's present, and therefore committing an offense is causing damage to that Kedusha. They all pay equally. That's what he says, but I recall that it's mentioned in the Kabbalah that nonetheless, in the upper worlds, there is a difference between a Sadiq and an ignorant individual. You should have known better. You had a greater neshama. The pgama your neshama and your soul, the damage, the stain is a lot more than on this individual who did not know. What he mostly is really focused on here, perhaps, is the rectification that the neshama needs in this physical world, perhaps. It's the same. The punishment is the same for both. But in the upper worlds, the greater the person is, the more they demand and expect of him. So obviously, you knew more, how come you didn't do as much as you knew, according to what you knew? You saw the king. You were aware of him. And you still did this? Could you imagine? The stain on his neshama, of course. So in the upper worlds, I believe there is a difference. What he's focusing on is in this physical world, there's somewhat of, of a similarity between the, the, the tzaddik and the one who's ignorant because it's the same offense. The damage was done to a particular mitzvah. Whereas in the upper world, we're talking about the neshama. To finish up the perek, he says, the reason why it says bahamot, as I was like beasts, not just the beast, but the beasts in the plural. Rashon Rabim, why does it say it in the plural sense? Lirames ki lefanavit barach gam p'china da'at ha'ilyon ha'kolel. Chesed u'gvura nidme kabehemot v'asiyah gufanit legabe orensof. In other words, if we compare before Hashem, Da'at Ha'ilyon, which comprises of Chesed Bura, Nidme Kabahamot, Vasiyah Gufanit, the Gabi Oret. So, in other words, even all that, that high level, is compared like an animal, if we compare it to the Oren Sof. All that is like a Asiyah Gufanit, it's also just like something physical, physical matter. Even though we're talking about Da'at Ha'ilyon, which comprise of Chesim Vura, even that, if we compare it to the Or and Sof, they're nothing. Kemosh Katub, Kulam Bechokhmah Asita, you've made them all with your wisdom. So we see the word Chokhmah and Asita together. Asita is the Olam Asiya. In other words, the physical world is physical, even though it's made with the Chokhmah, it has no comparison to the higher worlds. Benikra behemar rabba, kemosh katub in Mekokah, it's also called behemar rabba. Vehu shem ben begimatre behemar shelifne atzilut. And it's also equivalent, the numerical value of the name of Hashem ben, which is 52, which is the numerical value of behemar, which this name is lifne atzilut, before atzilut. What that means is that there's a certain place in the higher worlds, where there is no understanding whatsoever, higher than Bina, because Bina means understanding. Behemot can therefore be two things. No knowledge whatsoever, just like an animal, very, very low, very unrefined, or so close to Hashem, which is beyond Bina, which is before Atzilut, which is represented in the name Ben, 52. Which again, he's saying this is a remez in the words in Tehillim of I was like Bahamut. Because of why, why say it in the plural sense? Because we have the two meanings of Bahamut lack of understanding or a greater understanding, such a greater understanding that is beyond the level of understanding, where one is completely annulled, which is, which is a step higher or before Atzilut. This is how he finishes the Perek.
basically what we see from this is that even though one can be like Bahamut, you know, is a very, very simple individual and a very, very low level, he can still connect on a very, very high level, at least during the time that he observes Torah and Mitzvot. Therefore, we don't minimize any mitzvah that any Jew does. Even though he did it once in his life, it's very meaningful. Not only in this world, this, it could give him a long life just because of that one mitzvah. It has formed some sort of a connection. And in the merit of that connection, perhaps he will have good kids. And even though he may not have done everything else right, upstairs they don't forget about that. It's an accomplishment. Every mitzvah is an accomplishment. The more so the one who does this at all times, observes and is careful and he tries his best, then the Zatashem, his connection with Hashem will become even mm -hmm. stronger.